So it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session in the Arrhythmia Alliance and Heart Rhythm Congress entitled Remote Monitoring of CIEDs from Burden to Opportunity. So we know that CIEDs, cardiac implantable electronic devices, have improved the care of patients. They improve patient survival. The indications and applications of CIEDs is expanding and the number of patients who receive them is also expanding. So the devices improve patient outcome and there's a responsibility to monitor the patients and to follow them and to access the data contained in the devices, both from a diagnostic point of view and any therapies that the devices have delivered. So in the current era, given the volume of patients and the complexity of patients, it's not possible to see every patient in the clinic on a regular basis. So remote monitoring has a huge application here. It's been advanced as a, uh, as a tool to help us manage patients with CIEDs. And this has been highlighted by the COVID pandemic, where we were really forced to adopt remote monitoring technologies to follow our patients properly. But remote monitoring also creates some challenges. So as we move to remote um, patient management and devices notify us of information via alerts. We found that many alerts carry clinically non-actionable information and therefore they divert valuable clinical resources without improving patient outcome. So these are significant challenges in remote monitoring. So it's my pleasure to welcome my co-faculty who will discuss how we can address some of these challenges. I have Matthew Swift, who's a physiologist at the Great Western Hospital in Swindon, UK, and Dr. Michael Kuehl, consultant cardiologist at the University Hospital of Coventry. And I am Neeraj Varma. I am at the Cleveland Clinic in the United States. So I would like to introduce, first of all, Matthew Swift, who will discuss why remote monitoring can be a burden and how can we address this. Matthew. Thank you for the introduction, Professor Varma. Yes, my talk um, will centre on our experience really over the last 10 years and how we've found that it's predominantly the creation of alerts, um, which has created a burden for our, for our service. Uh, so we'll just talk a little bit about our experience in Swindon at the Great Western Hospital. Um, so we've routinely followed up all our devices remotely. Um, that's across pacemakers, ICDs, CRT devices, loop recorders since 2010. So we've got 11 years or so experience um, of fully remote follow up. Our total patient population sits at just under 5000 patients currently. It's quite a large geographical area um, that we cover uh, that takes in the Swindon area. Then we head out towards Bristol, um, up towards Oxford. So it's quite a large geographical area. So remote monitoring really does help us to see a lot of these patients a lot more um, efficiently. Over the last 11 years, we've carried out 35,000 remote interrogations of devices. So that's the scheduled sort of yearly or six monthly device follow-up. And in 2021, our remote monitoring service runs seven days a week. Um, we um, routinely look at the patient alerts, patient, patient um, download alerts, um, usually 364 days a year. We tend not to um, look on Christmas Day. And our team has expanded. Now we have a team of nine um, accredited device specialists, physiologists who run our remote monitoring service. And they're accredited either by the IBHRE, the British Heart Rhythm Society, um, or the European Society. We have scheduled follow-up remote interrogation clinics five days a week. And currently our remote monitoring population sits at just over 3,000 patients. Having this system um, has allowed us to provide tertiary services to our colleagues at the Royal United Hospital in Bath, where we implant and we follow up their advanced device services as well. What we found is that as we've placed, um, we've implanted more devices over time and our population of uh, remote monitoring patients has expanded, it's created an exponential growth um, in the number of alerts that we see um, per per year. Uh, the graph to the left um, shows how this, this number has increased from when we first started tracking this, um, this metric back in 2015, about 400 alerts per month. We currently see around 1,800 alerts per month in our population of 
just over 3,000 remotely monitored patients, which is a, which is a, a huge amount, creates a huge work burden for our um, physiology team. Um, we're very stringent with our programming of alerts. Um, we deactivate alerts which are not clinically significant, you know, patients who have known AF, which are treated, those alerts will be turned off. We individually program these alerts for um, specific patients based on their lead parameters or the way the device is set up, their implant indication, but still the number of alerts does tend to run away slightly um, and is particularly hard to manage. There are burdens and inefficiencies also that exist within any remote monitoring service. Um, there's a variation between industry manufacturers. Um, download frequency, for example, uh, biotronic devices will tend to download every day. So we get up-to-date information every day where some of the other manufacturers devices, Abbott, uh, Medtronic, for example, only download when they have an alert which they need to show us. The type of alerts created also differs between manufacturers. Some manufacturers will show you some alerts for some, some instances which other uh, manufacturers don't show. So there's a different level of sensitivities within the remote monitoring population. There's an inability to remotely change some of the alerts that we pick up. Um, some of these patients need to be brought into clinic to have their alerts um, altered and tailored to their specific needs. And this creates a burden on clinic, which really we we could do without, especially in the COVID era, where we're seeing less patients in clinic. It's difficult, tricky for us to standardize our, standardize our processes because these manufacturer variations mean that we have to treat different patient sets differently. And of course, there's the adult problem with disconnected monitors, which is onerous on workforce and time, having to phone, phone up patients, ensure their monitors are connected. And the other question is, is this a job for clinically trained staff? In our centre, we have one of our um, accredited physiologists who runs this service, who does the majority of this work, because the funding is not there for an admin person to take on this role. So due to our history with remote monitoring, um, we were approached by Implicity in early 2021 to trial um, their platform um, for use in the UK and the National Health Service. Um, when I first looked at it, I thought this has the, the potential to answer some of the questions um, that have been posed there and some of the issues that we found um, with remote monitoring over time. It allows us to create standardized processes, so not manufacturer specific. Um, we find the data is presented in a standardized format, and we know from um, papers uh, published to do with uh, human factors and papers from the aviation industry as well, that standardization of processes, less variation leads to less errors over time, which is very important in this um, follow-up of devices. It also allows us to increase the download frequency of our devices. So for example, our Abbott devices, which only used to send us information of routinely every six months or when an alert come through, comes through, we can put those onto a one month download, uh, which doesn't have too much effect on the battery, but gives us a lot more information um, a, a lot more telemetry information to get an overall picture of the um, patient's welfare. You would think this would create a larger alert burden, um, but all these are filtered by the Implicity platform, so it hasn't created um, a significant increase in the non-clinically significant alerts that we see. So how has Implicity helped us? Well, it allows us to intuitively control the alerts that are presented to us, so once an alert is presented, we can change that alert priority um, as we are dealing with that alert. We can also snooze alerts for a period of time. So say, for example, we get an alert for a patient um, who's having um, runs of VT some, or some kind of uh, arrhythmia, and we contact the medical team when that patient's medicated. Um, we, could then uh, we could then snooze that alert until the point where we might think the medication may have taken effect, and then we can look again. So we're not... We're not repeating alerts. It also gives us the option to turn off clinically irrelevant alerts, which previously could all only be turned off in clinic. So though that information is still picked up by the, um, by the manufacturer, the industry uh, home monitoring website, but Implicity filters the alerts that we see um, on a day-to-day -day basis. It allows us to communicate more effectively within our team. 
Um, patients who are medicated, for, for, for example, we can make it very obvious on the main patient screen um, by the little um, blood drop there. It shows that patients are on anticoagulation. So AF alerts for that patient. We know that the patient is on an anticoagulation. We're also able to send um, uh, patient information for review, uh, even either to one of the medical team um, for changing antiarrhythmic medication, for example, or heart failure medication. And it's also extremely useful, I found, for training some of our more junior physiologists. So if they were performing the remote monitoring alert session and they wanted, they had a, an issue that they wanted me to look at to clarify for them, uh, they could send that to me directly via Implicity on the platform. It just appears in a, in a little uh, to-do list. Implicity also has an answer for disconnected monitors. Um, now, we're due to start to use this uh, within the next couple of months or so. It just needs to go through our trust information governance processes. Um, so the Implicity platform is alerted when the patient is disconnected um, and an automatic text, text message uh, by our SMS can be sent to the patient um, to let them know that their monitor is disconnected and ask them if there's a reason for that, whether they're on holiday or something similar. They can then feed back. Um, to the, to the uh, clinic as to um, what's happened to their, to their monitor. Um, it will also coach them as to how to reconnect the monitor and the Implicity platform then knows either if the patient is away or if it has, uh, if the device is then reconnected. So it limits that human um, interaction uh, and makes the process of dealing with disconnected monitors um, more, more automatic. Matthew, thank you very much. So that is a very impressive operation that you have. You're practicing alert-based care seven days a week, which is very impressive. We can't manage that. Um, and you have a team of nine physiologists. Uh, so a couple of questions. Can you define the uh, role of a physiologist? Because I think this is specific to the UK. We have, uh, for instance, trained nurses uh, who then specialize in device management but perhaps you could uh, offer a few words on the role of the physiologist in the UK. Yeah, so the, the cardiac physiologists, as we have historically been called, or, or healthcare scientists, health cardiac healthcare scientists, um, we're really responsible for the diagnostic tests um, that are performed within the health service in the UK. Um, so for myself, my specialist area is, is in devices, uh, but also uh, we have accreditation in echocardiography, um, exercise tolerance testing, we work within the cath lab. Um, so we provide that important link um, really between the patient, gaining the information from the patient. Um, we then pass that on to the medical team to make their, their decisions based on, you know, the uh, changes to medication, implantation of pacemakers, for example. But when it comes to, say, for example, our, our remote monitoring service, that is a physiologist-led service. Um, we, we manage the patients on a day-to-day -day basis. We have great support from our uh, medical colleagues um, and we can pass on the information when they may need uh, medical uh, intervention. Terrific. Um, so that's a, that's a, a very uh, experienced uh, team that you have there. Uh, so related to that, how do you um, manage documentation uh, regarding the information that you receive? Uh, do you relay it to an electronic record? Do you alert the physicians when you have an actionable event? Yeah, so when, when we started to use uh, the Implicity platform, what we tried to do was, if I decided if we're going to test this out for six months, we need to test it in its entirety. So we use Implicity alone uh, for the management of our device alerts. If we have a clinically significant alert, or something that we think one of the medical team may need to see at a later date, such as a, a shock from a device, for example, um, we can print the PDF from Implicity into our hospital EHR. Um, so then next time the patient's in clinic, in, in any of the clinics uh, within the hospital, the fact that that event has been there um, will be clear and obvious for the, um, for the, for the medical team. All right. So you had shown in your, one of your initial um, slides the increasing volume of alerts, and you do practice alert-based care, which I think is the way to go. Can you estimate perhaps what fraction of those 
were clinically actionable, um, as opposed to say false positive or clinically non-actionable, uh, because that is a problem that we all face. And how do you think implicity would improve that proportion of actionable events? Yeah, I, I imagine that the majority are clinic, well, from, from my experience, the majority, majority that we have are clinically non-actionable. Um, so they're things that because we practice alert-based care, we try and make the system as sensitive as possible. A lot of these alerts that we get through are things that we, we would like to know, but we don't need to clinically action at that time. We just like to keep a, keep, 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 keep a watch on the patients. The ability of implicity to really um, what's that? to uh, really filter the alerts as we go along and alter sort of the um, the way that the alerts are managed as we check the alerts every day should reduce the amount of clinically non-actionable alerts. Um, as I mentioned in the talk, we try really hard to filter out um, false positive alerts by programming the devices um, and the, the alerts are implant based on the patient's implant indication and altering um, the alert management as, it, as, as, the, as the patient goes along. Super, well, thank you very much, Matthew. You're practicing uh, an advanced form of remote patient management, alert-based care. I know you're a leader and innovator in this field and we look forward to more work from your group. But it's my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Michael Hill. Consultant cardiologist at the University Hospital of Coventry in Warwickshire, in Coventry, UK. The title is A Third Party Platform An Opportunity for Research and Current Care. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for these uh, words of introduction. I wanted to follow up uh, on Matt's excellent talk uh, on a remote monitoring and want to lead on to the latest uh, guidelines that have been published just a month ago by the European Society of Cardiology. And here we can see that we have got a 2A uh, recommendation to use remote manage uh, management in patients um, uh, with pacemakers to detect early events, like for example arrhythmias or uh, therapies, whether they are appropriate or inappropriate, but also technical issues like lead failure uh, and the battery depletion. Um, just go back a slide, please. Um, it, there's also a 2A class uh, recommendation to extend the uh, physical contact with patients up to 24 months, uh, taking into uh, uh, um, account remote monitoring uh, and having this as a safety net. We've got a, a class one recommendation to use remote monitoring uh, alone in patients who can physically uh, are not in the position to attend the clinic and uh, uh, and have remote monitoring as the sole follow-up modality, but also to use uh, remote monitoring in patients who have got advisories on their devices and needs so that we can keep uh, an eye uh, on the devices and provide a safe care. But for the first time in the guidelines, next slide please, we can see that there uh, has been uh, made some reference to third party providers that can be uh, useful in triaging alerts and assistant with the tasks of the alerts as Matthew has already alluded to. Next slide. So we've, um, we've uh, Matthew had a, a number of slides on the, um, on the effect that implicit you can have on the efficiency of remote monitoring. And I don't want to go over all of them, but um, I want to point out a few more, if you can just um, click through. So we will have, through uh, management of the alerts, there will be a time-saving um, um, result uh, using uh, this third-party platform. You can um, visualize the parameters better. You've got smarter interfaces. But one point that hasn't been uh, mentioned is that um, uh, implicitly allows you to track the timeline um, of a devices independent of the manufacturer. So, for example, if you if a patient uh, comes up for a generator change and switches from one manufacturer to the next one, um, normally you would lose you would lose all the data on, for example, lead lead problems. So, if you've got um, <clears throat> a, a third party uh, platform that saves. Um, um, problems with the leads in the past that could still be uh, documented and can still come up uh, in the implicity platform, and is, that's useful. For, you would be useful for the management of this particular patient. 
We've talked about the improved communication between physiologists and clinicians, and we, we've uh, next place, and we talked about um, the um, disconnection so solutions, a really a good a way of taking away um, the alerts and um, especially the non-actionable alerts and resolving this um, uh, work, uh, uh, taking a, this, this work away from the physiologists um, that are you know, trained uh, hard to, to get to, to where they are. They don't have to do mundane tasks like pac phoning patients. Next slide, please. But I'd like to talk to you uh, really about research opportunities uh, and how Implicity can, you, can be used as a tool uh, to um, help you um, uh, conduct your research uh, studies. Um, but, uh, what this platform allows is to upload data onto the platform that is uh, targeted for your research. So for example, a consent form for a specific trial that takes um, uh, into account the, the data that you obtain from the platform. You can also uh, you, uh, uh, take advantage of a, an integrated electronic CRF um, on the platform. And into that CRF uh, data from all of the manufacturers can be integrated and normalized. And that could be demographic data, that could be data related to the heart rhythm, uh, data related to uh, uh, um, therapies, arrhythmia events, physiological data and device data. And just like Matthew um, said that the, um, the, the, the reports can be up, uh, uploaded into the hospital electronic records, as, uh, has, hospital electronic records can also be used to um, fill in the electronic CRFs on the platform. And because it's a cloud-based service, you can imagine conducting a multi-center trial using um, this platform um, and have multiple hospitals using the CRF to conduct the research trial. Next slide, please. So here in, uh, in Coventry, um, we are um, um, starting to um, um, conduct an observational prospective trial to look especially into how uh, Implicity enhances our efficiency how, how much time do we save? How much uh, more patients can we see by using this platform compared to the uh, um, usual way of uh, remote monitoring? What is the quality uh, of the uh, data that we receive? And how much are the physiologists who are the, um, um, the healthcare professionals that are in charge of the follow-up of, of patients, how they're satisfied with this new um, product. But what I, as, am, as a heart failure consultant, am particularly interested is the integration of a device um, implantation, but also follow-up and the integration of heart failure services. And I think that um, this product uh, allows not only to communicate better with the clinicians, but also to extend communication towards heart failure nurses that can take uh, advantage of um, alerts that not relate to arrhythmias, but are related to heart failure decompensations, like, for example, biventricular pacing alerts or uh, atrial fibrillation burden or, or other parameters that have been shown to predict heart failure um, decompensations. Um, and, the platform allows to integrate other variables beyond the data that is captured by the devices. For example, the weight. Um, there is a specific weight, a scale, uh, um, that can upload the patient's uh, current weight onto the platform that can be depicted here and can help to the assessment of, patient, of the patient's heart failure condition when um, um, he's being um, assessed remotely. And the future um, of of this kind of product is really um, how can you benefit from the immense amount of, of data that is being captured by this implantable device that constantly is recording data and, and you can imagine that an artificial, artificial intelligence based algorithm um, can predict uh, or, or uh, should have the aim to predict heart failure decompensation. And that is uh, something that I know that the company is working towards, and that would be uh, of, of interest to our community. And this is what I will uh, conclude with. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that's an excellent overview of, of the situation um, confronting clinicians and researchers who want to use remote monitoring data streams. 
So one of the highlights uh, that you mentioned was that the guidelines are um, recommending strongly the adoption of remote monitoring. Uh, and that follows from the US guidelines in 2015, which also gave a class 1A recommendation of remote monitoring for patient management of, uh, uh, of those receiving CIEDs. Remote monitoring preference to end clinic based care. So I think this is where the field is moving. This will become the standard care. And um, I would like to uh, highlight another point that you made, uh, Matthew, uh, Michael. Uh, which is the integration of device and heart failure services. So for instance, in our, in our institution, we have electrophysiologists who manage devices and device-related data. And then heart failure, which is a distinct group, they manage the heart failure diagnostic part. But we don't have a method for streaming heart failure diagnostic data from implantable devices. And those diagnostic capabilities are increasing. We don't have a mechanism for streaming it to heart failure physicians who are best equipped to manage those data and those patients. So perhaps a few comments on that. How do you manage it and what do you see the future to be here? Well, the future is a consultant who's specializing in heart failure and devices, just like I am. Uh, and uh, it brings in uh, uh, the experience in the especially that field. Heart failure and electrophysiology is really a field uh, that is merging together. Uh, and, and I know in the UK, we have traditionally had the separate departments of electrophysiology and heart failure. But in our trust, we have just appointed a new nurse that sits alongside the cardiac physiologists uh, uh, in the middle between the electrophysiology and the heart failure department. And this nurse's role will be exactly what we are discussing today to uh, look at uh, the data of patients. How can we uh, use the, uh, the, 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 the data derived from these devices and optimize the heart failure um, of, um, uh, uh, management for patients there. Not only have we had an acceleration of technology in terms of uh, devices, but also an acceleration in terms of treatment for patients with heart failure recently. And remember that most of patients with complex devices have got heart failure. So um, it's important that these patients are looked at. Are they on optimized medical therapy? And this is exactly what we are concentrating, uh, concentrating on here in Coventry. And I'm sure soon there will be recommendations to uh, address exactly that gap. So thank you very much, Michael. I mean, that's a very visionary approach, and I think that addresses a outstanding problem in the world of devices and heart failure. So I congratulate you on that initiative. So I'd like to uh, follow on from your last comment on your outlook for the future on artificial intelligence. And we've heard a great deal about artificial intelligence uh, in, in the public domain, in the media, and also in the medical literature. It's been applied very effectively for radiological analyses, for MRI analyses, uh, for oncology, little to cardiology, but there's gathering interest here. And in the world of implantable devices, where we collect so much data from a variety of different data streams, there's a huge opportunity for better patient care through artificial intelligence innovation. So I'd like to present to you here some of the first data using the implicity algorithm and AI cloud-based analytical algorithm uh, to improve our alert management for patients with loop monitors, with link devices, and really to manage the false positive rate or the clinically non-actionable uh, data that uh, Matthew was alluding to earlier. And that, that is a huge distraction to us as physicians and to physiologists and consumes valuable clinical resources. So we really have to address the false positive rate. So a novel proprietary algorithm reduces the false positive rate of Medtronic link to ICM devices by 79%. This is an abstract that was presented just three months ago at the Heart Rhythm Society. And this was led by Arno Rosier, uh, who is the president of Implicity. So the objectives of this was to evaluate a novel AI-based algorithm that reclassifies arrhythmias in ICM ECG strips. We measured its ability to decrease the false positive rate when compared to the device-based analysis. 
yet maintain a high sensitivity, not to lose valuable data. It's critical for any AI algorithm. So the implicitly IM007 algorithm is a novel al algorithm based on a proprietary artificial intelligence training method. The training is based on an annotated database of ICM episodes collected by the Implicity Remote Monitoring Platform. So in this case, only Medtronic Reveal linked devices followed on Implicity were tested at 31 EU and US sites, 455 patients altogether. Patient triggered and non-interpretable artifact ECGs were excluded. So we concentrated on the ICM defined abnormal episodes, 695. 60 were excluded after adjudication because of uh, artifacts. Then the analysis uh, was performed of ICM defined abnormal events by an adjudication committee, expert electrophysiologists. And the same data were then reanalyzed by the AI algorithm IM007. So the adjudication committee adjudicated that 31%, 219 of 695 ICM defined abnormal events were false positives. So this is a significant load. In our practice, sometimes this is larger. So this I think is a conservative estimate. 60%, 416 events were true positives. When the algorithm was applied, then out of the 219 false positives, 174, that is 79% of those false positives were reclassified. So therefore the IM007 algorithm reclassified potentially distracting data. 413 of the 416 true positives were correctly identified by the algorithm. The remaining three, the remaining three were atrial tachycardia episodes associated with noise artifacts. So preservation of true positives by the IM007 algorithm was accompanied by a dramatic reduction in the number of false positives. So this really alludes to the point made earlier by the earlier speakers that we really have to remove some of the false positive, the clinically non-actionable data that really just distract from uh, care and consume valuable clinical resources. Uh, one slide back, please. You may have to edit this part. So altogether, regarding ICM adjudicated episodes, the sensitivity was maintained at 99.3%, but the specificity was 79.5%. That is a dramatic reduction in false positives. And this really affected AT and AF events. So 99% sensitivity, 82% specificity. This is important because ICMs are often implanted for detection of atrial fibrillation and measurement of burden and false positives in ICM events are uh, a huge burden to device clinics. Overall in the CIED population, AT and AF events are also the most frequently triggered alert. So a mechanism for managing this is critically important for us and for patient care. So in conclusion, I would like to say that this novel IM007 algorithm from Implicity reduces reveal link false positive episodes by 79% while maintaining a very high sensitivity of abnormal ECGs. This has the potential to reduce ILR analysis burden while preserving patient safety. And as we move on to a model of remote patient management where we have cloud-based analytics that process incoming data streams for the physician who can then direct actionable, um, care, actionable care to the patients who actually require medical attention. So the algorithm here reduces unnecessary clinic evaluations by 79% compared to conventional or ICM-based analysis. So this really has a benefit for the clinician, for the hospital systems, 
and to patients. Thank you very much. A really interesting talk, Professor Varma. Can I, I uh, ask you a question? What do you think uh, the future will hold in terms of artificial intelligence, particular uh, to predict atrial relation, but also artificial intelligence in, uh, the, in, in management heart failure? Maybe we can have a group discussion around this topic. Yes, thank you very much. Very important point. So this is really the first preliminary um, AI algorithm applied to the common alert that we receive is atrial fibrillation. Very promising results. We would like to extend this to other loop monitors from other manufacturers to make sure that the same um, uh, success is applied there. And then also extend it to pacemakers, to fibrillate PRT devices. And then, and to other diagnostic abilities of these implantable devices. Because as we know, the therapeutic part of implantable devices, CIEDs, is very well established. The diagnostic capabilities continue to expand. And we are not in a position where we can analyze every single street, um, um, data stream. Uh, we need to be able to process these automatically. And this really applies to heart failure. And we found that any individual parameter cannot predict heart failure decompensation very well. We really have to perform multi-parametric analysis. And from a different group, we've seen that um, applying AI mechanisms to data stream contained on conventional um, uh, device diagnostics, for instance, like heart logic, can improve sensitivity and improve specificity of alert-based care for heart failure management. Again, preliminary data, but there are promises there. So my question would be, can a platform such as Implicity facilitate a heart failure prediction and preemptive action by embedding AI, for instance, like the one, the algorithm that I've shown for AF, perhaps one that can be developed for heart failure prediction. Do you think that a platform like Implicity yeah. can facilitate that? Yeah, sure. Um, so as you pointed out, the initial research into predict, prediction of heart, uh, of heart failure decompensation really centered around one single parameter. And I, I think to, to start off with, everybody was very excited about thoracic impedance. Now we know that we have to uh, take into account m multiple parameters uh, and also obtained by multiple sensors. Um, but as I pointed out, these devices are uh, constantly uh, obtaining data and generate a huge amount of data that I don't think uh, we are, as humans, are able to sift through. So having the uh, artif artificial intelligence help, uh, I'm sure, can, can identify uh, not only one parameter, but a combination of parameters that uh, can you know, lead to um, kind of prediction of decompensations. And just using the, 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 the alert system that we've got, using the, the, the ability to the traceability of com communication bet between the several, um, s several healthcare uh, professionals, I'm sure um, allows us to uh, use Simplicity as a great resource to uh, treat patients beyond just um, uh, providing remote monitoring for the devices, but um, maybe um, it's useful as a, uh, as a means to provide a more holistic care for patients with devices and heart failure. Thank you. I endorse that completely. I mean, I think remote monitoring was first implemented to help us manage routine care of devices and patients. Now the possibilities have expanded hugely, and now we can possibly promise improved outcomes on the basis of remote transmitted data. But we really do need um, technology to assist us here. Uh, as uh, the data streams expand and their complexity expand, and we need AI mechanisms to really capitalize on the um, quality of the data that are transmitted and to integrate them and produce um, a meaningful, actionable uh, alert. And I think that's the way the future is going. So I think uh, um, we have 
we're moving in those directions. So implicitly, for instance, has shown that we can reduce uh, alert volume in a clinic and perhaps reduce the need for expanding uh, personnel. We're all resource constrained. Would you like to comment on that? You, ha you have a very uh, well-organized uh, clinic. You have nine physiologists. Do you think a platform simplicity would reduce the need to expand your workforce? I think it could. I think there's definitely the potential um, using implicitly. You know, it may take the the, the role of a of a human. Really, um, we found that using it just for this short time, it really shortened the amount of time that you know I in particular spend doing the processing of the alerts every morning, from around two hours to probably about an hour and twenty minutes. So it saved us 40 minutes of time just because the interface is so much easier to use. That's before you even get into the, um, the more advanced management of alerts and the, the, the AI technology. Um, going back to the AI on heart failure that we were discussing just then, um, we've utilized the principles of the infant study for the last five years um, to look at multi-parametrics for heart failure, um, for the record, the early recognition of, de de of uh, decompensated patients. And it really relies on the, um, the uh, noticing of patterns that patients may have and uh, within their um, heart, heart failure diagnostics. But what we often find is that these um, heart failure patients with advanced devices often have complex comorbidities as well. So we put up a lot of um, masqueraders do you think that there's the possibility that AI will be able to filter these masqueraders out? Yes, again, I think uh, as we expand uh, diagnostic abilities, perhaps coupling it to some wearable monitors as well, I think we have uh, an, a, a promise of reducing the masqueraders, reducing the false positive rates, which have you know, plagued all the single, single parameter diagnostics that we've used so far. So I think there's a huge promise here. There's a huge promise. Uh, and I think we will need a organization model like Dr. Michael Kills, where device management is coupled very intimately to heart failure management. I think this is, this is going to be the model for the future. Uh, but I'd like to emphasize that we do need technology to assist. And we're moving towards, you know, we've established reliability of implantable devices. We're really moving forward to improving patient outcome, particularly the, those uh, afflicted by the epidemic diseases of atrial fibrillation and heart failure through uh, alert-based digital care. So thank you very much to, the, uh, to my co faculty to the organizers. It's been a very, very um, informative session, and I look forward to future developments. Thank you very much.